gentlemen, welcome to another exciting episode of Analytical Fanboys. In this corner, weighing in at 220 pounds, it's Simeon, the Vacuuminator Scott. And weighing in at the opposite corner is... Me. Hi. Yeah, this 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 Chris. He's also <laughs> known as Boingo Rider. He's uh he's here. I we're, love we're messing gonna... up I love messing up any of your goose and gaffs. I know, but that's what makes them funny. Yeah. It's um I'm I'm your local jobber. Yeah. That's exactly what's going on. Um we are Except we I are have here. a except I have a bigger chin than James Ellsworth. Yes. Okay, so we are here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, to do a very um, special .5 episode of Analytical Fanboy, sort of a supplemental, if you will, on uh, something that was actually sent to us by a Mr. Ed Kehenel of Superior of Suspicious Behavior Productions. I apologize if I mispronounced any of that, um, but uh, he was... Um, told of us by uh ian harrington friend of the show who uh aka sid part two who i do a weekly or a monthly rather my, my words are all over the place tonight and i swear to god i have not touched a drop but uh he is uh he is someone who i do a regular monthly uh comic review show with and he got sent a copy of this by um the people at suspicious behavior because because um, they apparently saw his show and were just looking for people to review the comic. And he said, well, I'm not that big of a wrestling guy, but I know someone who is. So he sent it to me, and I said, hey, um, this is a cool little thing. I enjoyed the first issue. I haven't read the second issue yet. They did send us both issues, and we're going to talk about them in this podcast, but I'm talking about that at the time. I had only read the first issue. So I'm going to send both of these to Boingo, and we're going to do an analytical fanboys on this. So, uh... Here we are. Um, this is, of course, not the crown episode for you. For those of you who haven't caught on, we're not talking about something on the list tonight. We are talking about this um, really interesting wrestling comic. So uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, this is um, Invasion from Planet Wrestletopia, issues one and two. Um, Chris, why don't you go ahead and... Uh, Give your general thoughts on this comic and tell me your best thing, worst thing. Well, should we give like a brief like synopsis? So when we're talking about general plot points, because to talk about something, you have to spoil it. That is true. So um, for the there general will audience. be spoilers in this uh, to, a, to a general degree. I don't know how in-depth we'll get. But also this, um, these two books feel like act one of a major big story. Yeah, yeah. So it's like um, saying it's like saying oh Luke's par uh, Luke's aunt and uncle die in episode four yeah that's technically a spoiler but it's not that big of a spoiler it's like mm -hmm. that's the inciting incident so this is what we're talking about uh, I'll do the synopsis because why not uh, I haven't talked enough yet go for it man <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the story of what could basically be called a washed up wrestler who. Back in the day when he was still wrestling in big televised promotions in the 80s, it's... Yeah, in the 80s, because it, the story takes place in the 90s. Uh, 1999, if I remember the panel right. Uh, back in the 80s, when he was on televised promotion, he was a heel. He was tired of being a heel. Um, so he made a quick um, prop belt from a place called Galaxy Pizza. And he says, all right, I'm fighting the champion, but guess what? I'm already a champion, champion of the galaxy. You know, like, it's a goof, it's a gag. But it turns out, that was transmitted all the way into space. All the way to a place called WrestleTopia. Where the leader of the planet is the champion of the galaxy. And you went, motherfucker, I'm the champion, fuck you. Uh, and then yep. Alien Invasion. That's pretty much that it. That is that is basically it. Yeah, and um, it's a it's a really cool little um, opening to what I assume is going to be very much uh, uh, realizing your potential and proving your worth kind of a story. Um, and I really like how everything is set up. Um, the the main sort of duo in this uh, this wrestler 
who's kind of washed up and his uh, manager were really interesting to me. I like their sort of mentor mentee relationship a lot. And um, that, that whole moment where he's like, I'm champion of the galaxy. That was like a, okay, comic I'm with you. This is fun and awesome in the way that wrestling should be. And, yeah. and I'm totally down. Yeah, um, it, what really solid that though I was into it the whole time. But what really solidified it for me is during the invasion, they weren't fighting with laser guns, they weren't fighting with swords, n- nothing. They were fighting with suplexes. You just see in the yeah. background like fifteen suplexes going on at once, and it's yeah, like the cover of the second issue is amazing. <laughs> like, yes, that will take down all armies. A massive mm-hmm. amount of suplexes. Yeah, the the. Oh, I'm just looking at these panels right now, and there's this one panel of them attacking the White House, and there's this, there's one guy who's got a Secret Service agent in a in a hole. There's a, there's a guy who's got him in like a choke. There's a guy who's jumping to power bomb him. It's it's amazing. Yeah, but it's a fun. It's a goof. Uh, it's a really well done indie comic. Uh, yeah. Um. Like if I if my poll wasn't currently full because I limit my poll to fifteen books at a time, um, this this would definitely go right on it. And as is, I'll probably pick this up and trade when we've got the whole thing, because yeah. uh, because it seems like it's gonna be very solid and very fun. Um, the only real qualm I I have with it is just kind of like a general construction type thing. Some of the texts on, like, signs and word bubbles and stuff occasionally just doesn't blend in with the rest of the page and the art. It looks a little slapped on. And that might just be because we have a digital copy. Like, that might look better in print. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, that's, that's like, the only thing. And it's, a, it's an incredibly minor quibble. Yeah, and I... When all and, that dialogue is good. And I didn't even notice it. The dialogue is very well done. Mm-hmm. Um, um, it it felt very natural, like the we- the coolest thing about this was it also was completely like acknowledging the worked a- a- aspect of wrestling. Yeah, like the alien wrestlers. No, that's full on legit. That's how they fight. But on Earth, it's like no, they're talking about put this guy over that whole thing. Yeah, the uh, the conversation at the beginning of the first issue between our main character, who I'm sorry, when when I'm new to a thing, I just can't remember names that well. But I can't uh, remember his name. <laughs> um, oh, I just found it. It's Rory. Um, Rory. But uh, the conversation between Rory and the sort of Vince McMahon archetype promoter um, he's working for at the time is really good and feels like right out of something you'd hear from an interview of an of a uh, retired WWE superstar. Yeah. And uh, I I suppose we can go ahead and jump into it. Like Rory himself is very clearly um, supposed to be like a a sort of takeoff of Bret the Hitman Hart. At least that's I, what I got. I can see. I I can honestly. I can see that when you say that. But like, also think of it like this: He has the handlebar mustache of Hogan, uh, and uh, when we jump forward, mm-hmm. he has a general air and atmosphere. No, you know what the hell he is? He's Jake the he? Snake Roberts. I know very little about Jake the Snake. Tell tell me about Jake the Snake. Okay, Jake the Snake was a wrestler in WWE uh, in the 80s. Um, Mm -hmm. As his name would imply, uh, he had a snake. He carried a snake with him. And to taunt his opponents, he'd bring the snake to the ring. If they were knocked out, he'd put the snake on them uh, the whole nine yards. Well... Eventually, he was let go of the company, uh, or he was let go because of this. I don't remember the exact order of events, but he he fell off the wagon really, really hard. He got really into drugs. The whole that whole thing um, just really became a mess. His life like really took a downward spiral. And now that I look about Adam, hold on, let me get a picture of Jake the Snake Roberts and show you what he looks like and see if if what I'm imagining is true. Hold on. 
I'm doing this live! But now that I think about it, I think I think he is at least partially inspired by Jake the Snake Roberts. Especially because Jake the Snake was a heel back in the 80s, similar to Rory. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I know a little bit about Jake the Snake. Um, I've seen the match he had with... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can see the resemblance now. Um, but it's also I've... the timeline because the story takes place in the 90s, and that's when Jake the Snake was really in a bad way. True. Um, yeah. um, like, the only Jake the Snake match I've actually seen, though, is the one where he fights Andre the Giant, and Andre loses because he's scared of snakes. Yeah. You know um, the Undertaker is afraid of cucumbers? Uh, I think you told me that at one point, and that is hilarious. Like, um, Paul Bearer would, f- like, f- fuck with the Undertaker by having cucumbers in the urn. <laughs> <laughs> and during matches, he just open it and mother to go, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> um. That's fucking hilarious to me. Oh. <gasps> Fuck, I had a thing I was about to say. It. Um, I'm sorry. But, no, it's okay, it's okay. Like, your thing was good, but... Um... Oh, yeah, I was gonna say, like, just... When I read this, the thing I got from him was, of course, Bret Hart in the sense that he kind of, he has that moment where he thinks he's about to become champion, and then um, uh... the promoter changes their mind, and he's like, ah, screw this, I'm out of here. And Are you also... Talking about- are you talking about the screw job? Yeah. And also it reminded me of CM Punk because he had that moment where he's like, well, fuck you, not only am I leaving, I'm leaving with a belt. Even you, though it's a belt he made, this character made up. You do know that the CM Punk thing was a work that was planned. I know. Okay. I'm just making sure. Yeah. Because <laughs> it sounded like you were talking about it as if it was a shoot. Um... Steve Austin leaving with the belt. That was real. <laughs> he took his ball and went home. Yeah. Ah, uh, wrestling. Wrestling is good. Wrestling is great. This comic is good. This comic is pretty great. Oh yeah. Um, so, uh, what's what's what do you think of the art style and like general flow of panels in this? It's really it's the best way I can put it is it's really good bare bones comic paneling it's not like something revolutionary like uh the watchman nine panel or something experimental or anything like that it feels very much like they have the fundamentals down and they know what the hell they're doing and they can do it well yeah i i'd say that myself um I also just really like this art style. It's like, it's halfway between, like, cartoony in the way that you'd see on, like, a, uh, a TV show and, like, um, over-glorifying the, the physique, that's the word I was looking for, the physique of these characters, like tradi- most traditional Big Two comics do, which I think is what you want for kind of a fun wrestling story like this. Yeah. Like, it, it, it's a wrestling story, but it also is just kind of a general, like, fun adventure. Like, I want to read more just because it seems so a- engaging in that way. Yeah. Um, and, like, uh, the story isn't above its more dramatic moments is something I like. Where we keep describing it as, like, this fun thing, but, like, there's clearly a lot of tension between our main two characters, they split up at the end of the first issue. And the second issue literally opens with the alien invasion is happening. And the mentor character is like, fuck, I guess I better go find him. Yeah. Because he knows, Oh shit. Fuck. My boy fucked up. (laughs) And also the, uh, um, dwarf, the wrestler with dwarfism, who Rory was fighting um, in the fucking bar mm-hmm. went like, okay, we need to fucking we need to get to our buddy. Yeah. Because he is going to get his ass kicked. Um, 
Do you think he's uh, the the wrestler with dwarfism is clearly inspired by anybody? Because um, the way they played the match, I thought Hornswoggle, but like it could be someone else. I'm well, I'm not exactly sure. Well, d- dwarf wrestling has been a major thing in promotions for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. I can't think. So of it could any... just be a trope they're playing with. Yeah, it's just a trope. I mean, we've had Hornswoggle, but we've also had. Um, uh, El Torito in WWE as well. Okay. Um, there's been, I'm pretty sure there's been others. Uh, in fact, uh, there's there was at least one or two in the 80s that I don't know who they were, but I know they showed up every once in a while. Um, but he seemed much more of a, a pastiche of just like old style wrestlers, which wouldn't be popular in major promotions that's why he's in a bar just like the other guy yeah uh he just seems kind of uh, what's the best way to put it uh, <laughs> he seems very turn of a century kind of wrestler like um the the vaude villains before gotch was uh let go yeah yeah that's probably what it is like, um, even the character's head kind of reminded me of Gotch, Simon Gotch. That's not his stage name now, but when he was in WWE. Mm. Um, so, <laughs> let, let me ask you, let's let's jump ahead, ahead to another thing. What do you think is going on with the kid at the end of the second issue? Who do you think that is? I think that's Rory from the past past, isn't it? But the comic he picks, um, or the magazine he picks, has a picture of Rory with a guy wearing Rory's number one fan shirt. Um, hold on, let me pull up the comic panel page. Hang on, let me, I've got it up right now, I'm gonna try and reread it. Oh no, that that clearly is him, because it says Groch Harbor to 70s. yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, it's been a I, couple days since I read these, so... Yeah, because when I saw that, I took it as, oh, it's... he's... he wants to become a good guy because his dad was always presented as a heel or something. Is that what the comic is? or uh, What the panels are? Or is he a face and Rory wants to be um, a face like his dad? I think that's what they're going for. Yeah. Um... Like I said, I read these a few days ago, and then I just skimmed through them tonight in preparation for the show. Yeah, yeah, that's clearly what's going on, because there's a, the, the issue, the second issue opens with a flashback of his dad being, like, a a shitty, washed-up, drunk dad, and then it's, uh, it's, it's revealed to be a bad dream Rory's having. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Okay. Um, there's a thing I want to talk about, Go but ahead. I just want to say, I want to preface this. I'm not trying to say this comic is copying or taking influence. It, it just reading this reminded me of reading another thing, like very similar reactions and uh, feelings I was getting from it. It reminds me a lot of Kaniku man. Kaniku man. Um, yeah. I've not heard of that. What is that? Okay. You may know it more by the sequel that was localized in America in the early 2000s, Ultimate Muscle. Not ringing a bell either. <laughs> okay. Let me go back. I'm, okay. This might be the time in the podcast to um, remind everybody, I am fairly new to wrestling. Um, like, I had a take on this. I, I know stuff, as I have demonstrated throughout this, but... Chris is the really knowledgeable, like, wrestling veteran, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this as an analytical fanboys episode. But here's also the funny thing about that. We both started... I I didn't grow up watching wrestling. I've only started recently about the same time as Vac. You've just gathered more knowledge quicker than I have been able to. Yeah, I tend to do that. Um, But, Kaniku Man is a... Shonen Jump manga from the early 80s, 
starting in early 80s or late 70s around that time um starring the titular character Kenneku Man it originally started as a parody of Tokusatsu heroes like Ultraman and stuff like that mm. but it eventually morphed into a pastiche of superheroes and wrestling huh like how to best put it? Um, it started off with like an Olympic competition esque thing, but it was all professional wrestling because that's what the author liked. Uh, and it continued and continued um, with basically each arc. I am the villain of the arc. I am doing something evil. No, you're the bad guy. We got to stop you. How do we stop you? We have a wrestling tournament. Huh. Uh, and that's kind of most of the book, but it's the most of the comic, but it's really fucking good because um, you have some bad guys and good guys coming in and going like, you were a bad guy. Yes, but you saved me with the power of friendship. Like, literally, I want to I want to say that all the anime, I fight for my friends tropes really got started in Kendaku Man. <laughs> um... In fact, I, I I am one of the probably the few only people who would say the birthplace of modern shonen tropes is not Dragon Ball. It is Kinnaku Man. Interesting. I actually have a whole video planned for that. But on to the other topic, a lot of the themes and elements of Kinnaku Man is strength, uh, overcoming obstacles, and that kind of thing. And it's a fun, goofy, rompy uh, wrestling story, very similar to this. And in fact, another the major thing that made me go, oh, this, like, it made me kind of remember Kaneku Man a little bit, is the main bad guy of this comic. Remember what he looks like? Do you, uh, do you got him up? Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm actually right by the last page of issue one where we get a reveal of him. Okay. Uh, and he's got a dope fucking design. Manifest Destiny looks cool. Manifest is also a bomb, uh, bomb-ass bad guy name. Yeah. Um... Because it also implies... Because... Oh, shit. Hold on. I'll finish Connecting Man and then I'll get back to the thought I just had. Okay. Um, but there was a bad guy during one of the arcs called Neptune Man. And he looks mm-hmm. like this. And I'm sending you the photo. Okay. If it was sent. It's loading. God damn it, Discord. I was trying to make something dramatic and you fucked me over. <laughs> oh. Okay. That's interesting. It's kind of a similar design aesthetic. Yeah, I can see it. So, seeing him, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. He kind of looks a little bit like uh, Neptune Man. That's that's pretty dope. And I wasn't thinking, like, oh, he's supposed to be like Neptune Man because their, character, their characters are so completely different. It's uh, in Manifest Destiny seems to be a little bit more influenced by things like Doctor Doom and mm-hmm. guys like that. But it it connected synapses in my brain that just made me go like, oh yeah, I'm having the same kind of warm, fuzzy feelings reading this as I did reading Kaneku Man. I see. Yeah. So what was your thought about his name? Okay. You do know what the concept Manifest Destiny is, right? Uh, it's, it's about, like, seizing control of your life and getting your shit together and all that, right? In a more modern context, yes, but in a historical context, Manifest Destiny was a term that the, um, New United States of America, specifically the settlers, uh, used to justify expansion from the east to the west coast. Hmm. And when I say expansion, I mean seizing territory and killing Indians. Well, Native Americans. I'm saying Indians because that's the way they describe it. It is the colloquial term, even if it's... Yeah, but I don't like using it because it's it's ill-informed and icky. There's There's a lot of bad juju with that. I say bad juju. There's a lot of bad history with using that kind of word. Basically, uh, I can I can paraphrase Jim Jeffries and say, uh, Amer- uh, the English went looking for India and found America and just started calling everyone Indians so they could say they had actually gotten where they meant to go. Yeah. 
but um, so it was a, a, a it was a forcible taking control of land. So connecting that to wrestling, do you know what Vince McMahon did in the eighties? Um, I know he was a he was like a promoter and he. He did a lot of interviews and a lot of commentary, but nobody knew he was the owner of the company. That didn't come till um, the Montreal Screwjob, as we talked about earlier. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Um, well, time for a wrestling history lesson. So, okay. before the 80s, in the 60s and 70s, there was an organization called the NWA. The National Wrestling... I can't remember if this one was the National Wrestling Alliance or Association. I think it's association, but I may be wrong okay. on that. Basically, what it was was a bunch of wrestling promotions in different regions at the time called territories basically said, all right, we won't put on shows in your territory and you won't put shows on our territory, but we will share wrestlers and share information and just work together in order to put on wrestling in America. So... For example, uh, Dusty Rhodes had a territory in Florida. Um, uh, Vince McMahon's father had a territory in the New York tri-state area. That whole general area. New York, Connecticut, yeah. and that whole kind of thing. Uh, there was a territory in the Pacific Northwest. There was a territory in Chicago. Generally, you stayed in your territory, and that was that. Well... Vince McMahon find out, found out who his father was because he didn't know who his father was for a long time. So he went up, met his dad, started working for uh, the W... I think it was at the time WWWF. They got rid of a WWWF. Hmm. Uh, eventually, his dad wanted to retire. And instead of giving it to his son, um, Vince McMahon bought the, the, the WWF from his father. Under the condition, right. under the condition that he would not buy out other territories. Guess what Vince McMahon did? He bought out other territories. Yes, <laughs> he bought other territories and thus their wrestlers, and also their venues for putting on wrestling shows. He went from East Coast to West Coast taking over territory manifest destiny hmm yeah so do you think this is literally jake the snake versus um vince mcmahon is that I, what you're trying to say i'm not trying to say i i think i think any of the characters are just pastiches like Rory's kind of a little bit of Jake the Snake, a little bit of Brett the Hitman Heart. I also see a little bit of, just in his uh, substance abuse, um, Ric Flair. Mm. Especially with the thing he says earlier, it's like, I'm the wheeling, dealing, kiss stealing. He doesn't do the Ric Flair version of it, but he does a thing that's kind of similar to Ric Flair's uh, whole shtick. Yeah, that was that was something I noticed and completely forgot to point out. That was that was a cool little um, homage sort of a moment. Yeah, like if you know Ric Flair's "I'm a wheel and deal and kiss stealing son of a gun," yeah, you go like, "Oh shit, he did the Ric Flair thing." Um, hell, I wouldn't even. I, I can't remember if he did, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was a, like one panel of him just going "woo" uh, in a match. But yeah, there is. Uh, no, I was just saying I wouldn't be surprised. Either. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, like, Manifest Destiny also has a lot of pastiches. He has a mask similar to a lot of luchadors. Uh, it's metal, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, his blonde hair is similar to Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Um, it, behavior is a little Vince McMahon. Uh, the whole concept of, no, I'm the best. Fuck you. Uh, yeah. Again, the little Vince McMahon. I'm Vince McMahon, damn it! God, Vince McMahon's so fucking great. Yeah. He's great, but also not so great. Mm -hmm. Look at Raw. Oh, did yeah. I just... Did I just throw shade? 
No, I spoke truth. Oh! <laughs> oh, Lord. I think we got it mixed up in the intro. You're you're the guy out here cutting promos. I'm your hype man. <laughs> you're the manager? Yeah. Oh, man. But, yeah, no. Like, there's a lot of cool things. Uh, I'm pretty sure if I went back through some of the background wrestlers that were invading and doing six suplexes, bra, mm -hmm. uh, i probably recognize a couple. Um, well, I'm pretty sure the guy who comes uh, to Manifest Destiny at the end of the first issue is supposed to be like a, uh, a gold dust kind of guy. That's possible. Um, yeah. Pretty dope. Pretty dope wrestling. This was a... This was a good first issue, first uh, couple issues, and um, I'm definitely interested to see where the story goes from here. Like I said, I won't be keeping up with it right now, but it's definitely something I'm going to want to come back to when I have some time and money for it. Oh, yeah. This is definitely something I want to pay money and just support wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. I mean, who knows? Maybe... Uh... Maybe once the trades are out, we might do uh, actual episodes of AF with these on the list. That'd be cool. The biggest thing um, is, uh, since it's an indie comic, I'm, I'm mildly pessimistic is, uh, I think, the best word, that it may not get a trade just because it's a small company and they may not be able to do a trade. That's true. Um, I mean, this is this is a indie company that's um, on the level of indie where I hadn't seen this in uh, Diamond previews, so I don't even know how um, I would get a hold of this through my comic shop. I'd probably have to order it directly from uh, Suspicious Behavior, which uh, is perfectly fine. I understand everybody's got to start somewhere. I'm, I'm just saying this isn't going to be the easiest thing for people to get a hold of unless you want to go digital. Yeah, but, like, read it. Read it. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I mean, we've kind of gone the rounds with this thing and said everything we can say aside from little things like, hey, it's a crazy awesome idea to put the Earth in a steel cage. Um, oh, fuck yeah. That is yeah. such comic book bullshit and I love it. Yeah, um, and, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a. And they call it a steel cage. It's it looks like a hell in a cell. Yeah, but that's just because it has a roof. That's true. <laughs> because putting a weird cage ring around the Earth kind of doesn't do anything. That's but, true. But that would just be the greatest goddamn like image, like. I am so confident in my wrestling ability to wrestle Earth. I am just going to put a ring around your planet in the shape of chain links. Yeah. Man. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode of Analytical Fanboys. We will not be answering any questions and, of course, not um, selecting anything for the next episode from the list because this is not a regular episode. This is a supplemental you know uh, what? We could do a lot more point fives. I want to pitch this to you live on air for the audience to hear. Okay. What if there's like a thing where both agree we want to watch like now, like say Money in the Bank? We do a point five. Oh, uh, we could do that. Um, Just, oh, like, not ex go the, ahead. Or like we go, we both see a movie and we go like, hey, we I, we both seen this movie. Let's talk about it. Hmm. I mean, that is kind of the purpose of the point fives to be like, hey, I just saw this thing and I really want to talk about it, but I don't have time to make a, uh, a big edited video about it. You want to do a podcast about it. Um, yep. But, uh, um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. We might do an episode on Money in the Bank. It depends on how schedules line up and all that. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, um, like I said, uh, no questions this week, no selection from the list. Uh, so, Chris, why don't you go ahead and tell the kind people where they can find you on the internet. Wherever locally sourced produce can be found. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say something funny, and I don't think I succeeded. I, don't you, me, you love non sequiturs? Um... You can find me at Boingo Writer on YouTube. Uh, there'll be a link in the doobly-doo. Uh, 
at Boingo underscore writer on Twitter. Um, and here on the Poodcoost. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> you guys can find me, of course, on YouTube as The Vacuuminator. I do videos on uh, tokusatsu and cool superhero things like that. Um, if you want to keep up with me on a moment to moment basis, hey, I got a Twitter that's at The Vacuuminator. Um, and you can find me in all sorts of other interesting, neat places, but those aren't really the main attractions. If you want to get more of this podcast, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. We try and put out an episode at least every other week. Um, if you want to submit a question for us to answer on the next episode, go ahead and shoot an email over to analyticalfanboys at gmail.com. And make sure you put question for the podcast, okay to read on air, in the subject line. And hey, if you want to listen to the show anywhere you go at any time, there's a link down in the doobly-doo to go ahead and download an MP3 off Google Drive onto your phone. So Until you we figure to, out how YouTube. the fuck but, to get it on iTunes. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll do that at some point. But uh, for now, there's MP3s in the description. <laughs> and uh, I ho- that'll do it for this episode of Analytical Fanboys. We want to say thank you once again to the folks at Suspicious Behavior Productions for sending these comics to us to discuss. And we will see our viewers next time in an episode where we will be discussing the first season of the Netflix show, The Crown. Until then, this is Simeon, the Vacuuminator Scott. I am Chris, known as the being Boingo Rider. And we will see you next time. (laughs) 